Again, welcome everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Molly Rogers, and I'm the Associate Director of the Center for the Humanities at New York University. Today's event, Surplus Data, is a celebration of the forthcoming special issue of Critical Inquiry, which is also called Surplus Data. The articles in the issue relate to the work of the Digital Theory Lab, a collective of faculty and graduate students that began at NYU as a Bennett Polanski Humanities Lab. There are currently seven of these labs uh, at NYU, and each team is made up of faculty and graduate students from different disciplines who together tackle a big question, a topic that demands a multidisciplinary, non-hierarchical approach to research. After a period of intensive collaborative research, the HLAB team then teaches an undergraduate course, taking newly acquired knowledge directly into the classroom. This innovative research and curricular program is generously funded by Dr. Georgette Bennett in honor of Dr. Leonard Polonsky, CBE, and we are grateful for this opportunity to have this program here at NYU. The Digital Theory Lab was the first H lab in the program, launching in 2018. The lab team has continued to meet and pursue its investigations well beyond the initial funded period of one year. And today's event, Surplus Data, will, I think, ably demonstrate not only the breadth and depth of inquiry that the laboratory approach to research holds for the humanities, but also the probing work of the Digital Theory Lab in particular. We are delighted to bring this work to you today. There will be an opportunity to pose questions. We have a number of speakers who will present their work uh, briefly from the issue of critical inquiry, uh, but we will then have a Q&A period at the end. So we invite your questions. Um, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen so that our moderator can easily pull them out and, and address uh, your questions. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Leif Weatherby who will moderate today's proceedings. Leif Weatherby is Associate Professor of German and Director of the Digital Theory Lab at NYU. He studies German Romanticism and Idealism, Digital Culture, and the History of Political Economy. Thank you, Leif. Yeah, thank you, Molly. I, I, I really appreciate that very much. And um, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, uh, who's, who's watching and all of, all of the panelists and say thanks for coming at the end of a, a long and, and difficult semester. <laughs> Um, we're here to give uh, a sort of sneak preview of the upcoming critical inquiry special issue surplus data, which I think should be out hopefully before the year's end. Um, we intend by this term surplus data to replace the rather vague big data and to place the analysis of heavy data circulation and ubiquitous computing on firm critical ground. Some but not all of us working on and contributing to the issue are members of the Digital Theory Lab, which uh, Molly just gave an overview of and which has undertaken an intensive study of the history and theory of digital technologies and especially of the new wave of AI known as deep learning over the last three years. I can say for my part that this publication would not have been possible without the lab, which was originally funded by this um, generous grant from uh, Bennett and Polanski, and, and we're housed at the Humanities Center um, here at NYU. And we all owe a great deal of thanks to both of those organizations, to Molly, Kayla, Uli in particular, um, for the infinite generosity in these couple of wonky years we've had globally. Um, let me just sketch what we're going to do now. First, Patrick Jagoda of the University of Chicago and an editor at Critical Inquiry will say a few words, as will Orit Halpern of Concordia and Jeffrey Kirkwood of Binghamton and then me again. That will be to present the issue from an editorial standpoint and to summarize the work, uh, the work, uh, the intro we wrote together to the issue does. And then each contributor will talk for just a few minutes about their article. I'll introduce each speaker, but in the interest of time, I'll say just a few words by way of introduction and fuller short bios will be in the chat for you to peruse. And then we'll have some time for Q&A, which as Molly said, can be put into the, um, into the Q&A function on the, on the, um, on the uh, function tab there on the bottom. So um, Patrick, uh, could, could, could you take it away? Sure, thank you so much, Leif, Molly, Kayla, for putting this all together. Uh, I'll just do a really broad, quick introduction. So uh, across several decades, Critical Inquiry um, has published a number of special issues on topics like race, gender, and sexuality, politics and interpretation, narrative, psychoanalysis, uh, thing theory, intimacy, comics, aesthetic practices in the Chinese state, comedy, and many more. And I think that the issues the journal focuses on are not meant to mark uh, a fashionable topic or discourse. 
Um, it's true that they often zoom in on theoretical methods or topics that are emergent across the humanities, but more often the idea is not merely to mark an area of academic newness, but to construct a matter of concern by encountering it from varied perspectives and often uh, different disciplines. So particularly in the last decade, Critical Inquiry has uh, uh, published a number of essays about digital media but the surplus data uh, issue that this group has put together uh, is, is the first that I know of that's focused entirely uh, on matters of digital media with, with much analysis of the analog as well. Uh, and our contributors are coming from various different disciplines. We have philosophy, media studies, German studies, English, art history, uh, history of science and sociology. Um, and th this issue is, as Leif is already suggesting is not about something like big data in the humanities. Instead, it uses, I think, rigorous and creative uh, inquiry to mark a passage from the quantitative designation of big to the epistemological category of surplus. And this charts a kind of transition from a quantitative increase to a qualitative change. Um, the only other thing that I'll do is very briefly uh, just give you a taste of every essay with basically a sentence. Uh, so not intros of folks, but of topics. Um, so the issue starts with Alexander Galloway on the analog, and he argues that even a generation ago, the theoretical humanities were focused on codes, logics, digital matters. Today, we see a shift to matters of perception, experience, indeterminacy, affect. Um, so the core question is, what's going on uh, with people thinking about the analog in the digital age? Uh, then we have Sarah Pursue's essay on the digital ocean, which offers other roads into the question of the analog. And she offers the observation that uh, theory has given us many resources for thinking about uh, continuums, uh, including medium or ground. Um, and she takes us into, uh, you know, gives us concepts like the Lacanian real, Heideggerian being, the losing desire, uh, Malibu's concept of plasticity, which all in different ways uh, give us access to the continuous. And the essay itself gives us historical resources via Cantor and Turing uh, to think about some of these uh, distinctions and non-distinctions. Um, next, we have uh, uh, David Baron Porter, who offers a different kind of historical method. Uh, he ex excavates an alternative history by W.E.B. Du Bois, who uh, attempted to introduce quality into quantity of images of data uh, through an early critique of um, an ideology that is, of course, very per pervasive in our own time. Um, after that, we have a piece by Matthew Handelman, who takes up the case of the neural network chatbot Tay, uh, who learned to deny the Holocaust famously through interactions with human beings online, in fact, just hours after being, being put online. And, um, and uh, Matthew is analyzing Tay's history through the Frankfurt School's method of ideology critique, including uh, the work of uh, Adorno on anti-Semitism. Uh, next, we have Luciana Parisi, who makes an intervention into a post-cybernetics understanding of philosophy. And at the outset of, of her essay, she's asking, can the question of modern technology become the starting point for machine philosophy? Uh, and to do that, to think about tech, uh, transcendental instrumentality, uh, she turns to Jordan Peele's um, well-known film, Get Out, uh, the horror film. And then finally, we have pieces by uh, the three other editors of this issue from whom you'll hear in just moments. Uh, in her essay, Reed Halpern argues that neoliberalism and machine learning share a genealogy through the history of neural networks. Uh, and that essay is, is focusing on the moment between the 1950s and the 1970s to think about intersections between neoliberal thought, artificial intelligence, and reactionary politics. Uh, then we have Jeffrey Kirkwood, who analyzes the designed uh, inefficiency of blockchain uh, technologies. And this is an essay that's concerned uh, with implications of energy waste. Uh, but he also argues that cryptocurrencies offer a, a paradigm for understanding the transition from industrial era work to contemporary computation. And then last but not least, we have Leif Weatherby and Brian Justy, uh, who argue that neural nets are semiotic engines that rely on the index uh, to make and manipulate meaning. Uh, and the implications of this very careful semiotic analysis have implications uh, for platform capitalism in a variety of ways that they'll discuss. Um, and given that that Leaf and Brian are writing about the, the index, it makes sense uh, for that essay to, to finish my indexing, I guess, of this special issue. Uh, so now I'll turn uh, back to Arit, then Jeffrey, and then Leaf to talk more about our uh, organizing principle. Thanks, Patrick. Am I going now? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so I'm just going to open uh, with a kind of few events. I, I can't really speak for everyone, but I know what animated my concern in thinking about this movement between big data to surplus data and more broadly, the question of what work does media theory do in our present. So I'm just going to open with a series of recent events that at least offered me urgency to this issue and how's to consider or engage with data. On January 3rd, 2021, a struggling, seemingly inconsequential video game retailer stock GameStop spiked by some 50%. In the coming weeks, it would spike 100% more. This event seemingly targeted to injure several hedge funds that shorted the stock. The incident was attributed to the Reddit page, Our Wall Street Bets, a group that grew to over 8 million users following the collapse of the market due to COVID in March of 2020. This seemingly self-organized collective stayed in its direction against the wolves of Wall Street, absolute Robin Hoods. It is unclear, of course, whether this is true or it's self-prompted through the urging of other large investors. No matter, huge fortunes were won and lost, and arbitrary stocks and random cryptocurrencies have achieved institutional recognition. Infrastructuring the events were the ever-increasing dependence, of course, on social networks and big data systems to manage the pandemic, track disease, and mediate labor, social services, consumption, education, etc. Um, and of course, behind all this speculation was also the ever flashier and gamified interfaces of Coinbase and Robinhood and their sister trading and cryptocurrency exchanges. The aesthetics are all emojis and cute icons, constant animations. Need more cash? A gas pump pops up. A little feather in the corner reminds you the lightness of crypto coinage and the alterity of the endeavor. It all offers a new flashy real-time analytic playground that never actually shows your earnings, but always reminds you of your margin. Along this comically, literally with comics illustrated website, Reddit feeds offer slogans for the revolution, YOLO with options, while supposedly hacking capitalism. It's all done with frat boy flair meets slight, slick design of a lifestyle website. The Our Wall Street Bets is the natural platform to this endeavor, a testosterone field frenzy of shorting futures while comparing earnings all tagged in language that appears quite QAnon. In fact, a close comparison largely yields mirrors, even if not always politically congruent, discourses of retribution against the state and phantasmic organizations and extreme willingness by young men to engage in acts of seeming violence against what is understood as the establishment. If GameStop has been lauded as a democratic revolution, not all internet field insurrections have met with the same applause. On January 6, 2021, rioters protesting the president-elect Joseph Biden ransacked the Capitol building of the United States of America in an event that could be understood as live world black mirror to the GameStop scenario. Seemingly prompted through social media channels by former President Donald Trump, the mob comprised of members of numerous right-wing groups, including white supremacists such as the Proud Boys. I think actually someone's haunting this particular channel right now or, or pinging it, um, and social networks and immediately prompted discussion of the place of large data on social networks and democracy. Did computationally mediated networks play a role in encouraging and distributing fake news, attacks on science, xenophobia, racism, and anti-Semitism, along with virulently anti-democratic opinions? Did automated chatbots aid foreign powers in distributing and enhancing such messages? Did they assist the discourses of QAnon by enhancing and reinforcing certain messages through rapid telecommunications and through act targeted advertising and filtering of searches. In short, given the overabundance of data in a democratic society generated through billions of users online all the time, did all the noise end up ampl amplifying only the most zealous and fundamentalist messages while excluding those that are more marginalized, such as anti-racist messaging? The situation essentially asks to what do net machine networks attend and how does it modify human attention? Behind these media events, of course, both of which mirror their data networks, looks the ongoing relentlessness of the epidemic and the reality of human death and environmental destruction. These networks both evade, literally by hedging futures, the risks of climate change and pandemics while making it possible to envision, much less actually see, um, the black and brown bodies sacrificed to labor whose yearly salaries often amount to far less than a Bitcoin per year. The author Naomi Klein has labeled the situation a pandemic shock doctrine that has introduced a screen new deal to replace a green new deal, our media consuming perhaps our very biological existence. The screens should supplement shocks is however not predetermined. This issue, and this brings us to the stakes attendant to this issue. This issue very much takes as its central stake the use of theory to disrupt determinism 
and asks about the relationship between older order of big data and a contemporary situation of surplus data that I've just laid out for you. We chose this term surplus data because we question the deterministic assumption that computing will always relentlessly penetrate further into life to negative effect, while we simultaneously wish to accord the colonial, racist, anti-Semitic, and neoliberal and financial legacies haunting our media networks. We insist on the fact that history does not repeat, and it is our role to resist the consumption of the future through the technologies of the present, through the production of new concepts and discourses, and we demand accounting for the violences, the infrastructure of contemporary media systems. We choose surplus data because it opens to reevaluating political economy and labor, empiricism, and technical determinism and functionalism. And we hope that this might provide a provocation to expand and revise our understandings of the stakes attendant media uh, to media theory and the work that our own discourses might have in imagining more just and diverse futures in plural. And with that, I'll sort of end. Let me, great, awesome, thank you. Um, let me pass that off to, to Jeffrey um, next and then I'll say one or two words after that. Yeah, thanks Leif. Um, and thank you, Orit, for, uh, yeah, the beautiful outline of the work that we did in the, in the issue. Um, I guess the, the starting point for me in thinking about the, the, the question of surplus data uh, was in 2013 when there was the initial spike in the price of Bitcoin um, and I was losing a, a vast, when I say vast, I mean a very small sum of my graduate students stipend, uh, which prompted me to wonder about what exactly the mechanics uh, of that, uh, of, of, uh, of cryptocurrency were um, and what became clear to me, at least, and part of the motive for thinking about surplus data um, is that a lot of the principles of industrial efficiency, most of the principles of industrial efficiency, according to which um, the contemporary computational economy continue to be critiqued, um, are defined by 19th century ideas about reductive mechanisms for uh, eliminating infelicities, for instance, in a production process, um, which is distinctly not the case for uh, the operations of, of a computational or informational economy. Um, so for instance, in 1912, when you have uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor going before a special house committee on scientific management testifying um, about the dehumanizing uh, effects of scientific management on the production process and on human labor, um, the, the idea is that efficiency programs through these reductive mechanisms and uh, the, the harvesting of surplus um, are in fact um, sacrifice human labor at the expense um, of increased efficiency. Um, the idea that the $54 billion that have been reaped in profits from AWS services in the 15 years of their existence um, use the same principles of efficiency um, doesn't strike me as true. Um, and in fact, data rather than being descriptive is now a generative site for the creation of surplus that doesn't rely on reducing the amount of work done. Um, and when I describe the, the work of my paper on, on Bitcoin and blockchain in, in a little bit, I can give a better sense of this. But the idea is that um, the surplus of surplus data describes a condition in which um, in which principles of efficiency have in some way been inverted so that the production of more more data, more patterns um, and more analysis is actually the source uh, for for profit taking um, and surplus value. Um, and I don't want to take up too much time because I know there are a lot of people talking. So I guess I'll hand it over to Leaf. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to like dwell on this too much longer because I really want to get to the to the articles, and I think there's there's I mean there's there's just so much here. But uh, I do want to say that it was an absolute pleasure to work and think with all three of you, and actually with everyone here. But um, and I, I I like that you called it a condition, Jeffrey, because that's what that's what I just want to add at the at the very end is that like part of the shift is to say like once there was enough data circulating, really circulating, right? Representing things, but also like being a logistical medium through which like in increasing like global capitalism, global logistics just flows, right? Initially, like the, the emphasis was on how much there was. And 
of course, then we got that rubric of big data, right? And it's and it. I think that that a big thing that we do in the introduction is to say, big is quantitative, and it doesn't really tell us much else, right? It tells us about the ability of the data. It tells us like here are some sort of granular functions, like things that it might be able to do, etc. But it's not really the size or the abilities. It's a condition, like you said, Jeffrey. It's a condition we live with globally. It's a quality that has emerged from the the amplification and the like the you know the upward tick of that of that quantification that just goes you know off the off until we can't see it anymore and so it becomes uh, this 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 function that in which there's always more data there's always more to get from data and there's no way to deny that but just to say that that's big sort of denies the feedback loops that this is in, right? It denies the, the what what Orit has called like beautiful data, like the data surround in this in this deep sense. So that's what we were trying to get at. And without further ado, um, I want to I want to turn us right over to the to the articles. And uh, like I said, each speaker is going to speak for just a few minutes, and then uh, we'll we'll have some time for for questions. So. Um, our first speaker, our, our first, um, our first um, article in the in the issue is from Alex Galloway, who is here at NYU. Um, I'm going to turn it right over to you, Alex. Great. So, uh, welcome everyone. Um, now, as as scholars, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at things, reading texts, and trying to say something novel about texts and things under inspection. Um, yet from time to time, scholars will also turn their head around, as it were, to look at themselves, to inspect their own discourse, to scrutinize their own scholarly discipline. And my essay for this special issue is of the second variety. And it begins from an observation about the field. And here's the observation that scholars used to be obsessed with things like words, symbols, text, code, economy, logics, and structures. But now they seem to be more obsessed with things like ethics, aesthetics, affect, sensation, and real materiality. And for reasons I explained in the essay, I want to associate uh, that first mode with what we could possibly call digital thinking or digital philosophy, and the second mode with analog thinking or analog philosophy. Okay, so this observation leads to a question. Why in the digital age have so many prominent thinkers turned toward characteristically analog themes? And along the way, I offer what I believe to be a uh, specific, if not also rigorous definition of two important terms, uh, the digital and the analog. Um, and I suspect that some of you here are, are nominalists of, of some form, and you might scoff at the very notion that something like a field even exists uh, or could be characterized. Um, some of you might reject the notion that terms like digital or analog can be defined at all in any general way. Um, I simply disagree. Names, definitions, uh, and categories do exist in my view. Um, and in fact, they exist precisely as digital technologies, uh, which is part of the argument of the piece. Uh, and so the essay's conclusion is that while our industrial infrastructure might be driven today by digital machines, much work in the theoretical humanities is not. And hence we are living today in a kind of golden age of analog, which is the title of the piece. So I'm delighted to be part of this uh, special issue. Thanks. Alex, thank you so much. That's, um, that's great. Um, uh, let's, I'm gonna hand it over now to, to Sarah Porcio from Duke. And uh, Sarah, can you say something about your article? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um... So I started out wanting to write about the relationship between the digital and the analog in contemporary theoretical discourse uh, as it relates to the history of those categories in philosophy and mathematics from the 19th century forward. 
when I suggested that topic, the editors diplomatically made clear that it was basically already taken, namely uh, by what would become Alexander's wonderful exploration of the analog turn. Uh, this news turned out to be productive for me because when I went back to the drawing board, I realized that there's actually something very fundamental about the contemporary discourse of the analog that I don't understand. <laughs> and I decided to write about that problem. The question I ask in my contribution, which is called On the Digital Ocean, is essentially, what does it even mean? What can it even mean? And maybe more importantly, what can't it mean to talk about the analog or to think analogically from inside our current digital environment? The analog has been conceived for all kinds of solid philosophical and media historical reasons as the domain of waves and continuity and flows, i.e. as oceanic. The original Pythagorean slash Platonic analogos is a way of taking control of the continuous flows of linguistic and musical sound by introducing the structuring proportions of grammar and harmony. The later analog technologies effectively do the same thing using more sophisticated, less obviously Pythagorean mathematics. They measure, inscribe, and reproduce oscillations, i.e. waves, of continuous acoustic, electromagnetic, or thermal flows. The thing is though, the flows we currently really need to get under control are themselves digital. And the digital is discontinuous by definition. It's a matter of discrete zeros and ones, of singular separate countable digits like the fingers on my hand. If we're drowning now, we're drowning in bits of information in a surplus of data points, which means it seems to me that it's no longer clear that the analog, whether we mean it in the ancient platonic sense or the modern technological one or both, it's no longer clear that analog thinking can help us anymore. If even physics, if even space time is discontinuous, which it turns out it might be, if both the cosmos and thought operate on the model of computation, which it turns out they might, then we might also need a theoretical vocabulary that doesn't privilege the idea of an uncomputable continuum in order to talk about our present tense reality. I think it's easy to underestimate how hard it is to even take this idea seriously. I at least found it very hard. Um, I spent most of my time in the article trying to show that and how a break occurs between Georg Cantor's set theory and Alan Turing's computability theory on the topic of the foundationalness of the continuum. We we tend to think of the two as inhabiting a similar kind of conceptual space, one committed to the mathematization of the real, say, or to the foundationalness of number for thought. But actually, I want to say, Cantor, together with most of those who come after him in the set theory world, albeit in different ways, Cantor remains deeply committed to the idea of an uncountable, non-computable matrix of being. And part of the thrust of my article is also to say that even many of the contemporary or contemporary-ish theories uh, that for instance, Alexander qualifies as digital, and I would agree with him, uh, but I do think that they also, for instance, post-structuralism and its classical deconstructive form rely very heavily on a notion of an uncomputable. Um, they just situate it differently and place it otherwise. Um, whereas Turing, along with most of those who come after him in the computability theory world, does not. He does not rely on an uncountable, non-computable matrix of being. I think we have to at least confront the possibility that we live in a world that's more like Turing's than Cantor's, regardless of what the physics says, because the ocean that we're currently drowning in is unambiguously digital. And I think confronting this possibility would mean trying to rethink the concepts and figures we have historically used to navigate in and around oceans, including, but not limited to, the concept of oceanic flux or becoming and the corresponding figure of an oceanic femininity. I'm thinking here obviously about the Deleuzian becoming woman, but also about all the other annoyingly mysterious woman figures who play such foundational roles for contemporary theories of technology, the Anthropocene, the political, and so on. Stiegler's Pandora, Latour's Gaia, Badiou and Lacan's, not all, Hitler's sirens, literally everybody's Cora. As I say in the conclusion to the article itself, I think if we're going to make a real progress on this problem, we're going to need to stop making the mystery of the non-denumerable, non-analyzable continuum, and by extension also the mystery of woman, capital W, do so much conceptual and rhetorical work for us.
Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, our next <laughs> next is uh, David Baring Porter from the New School. Great. Thank you. Uh, so first off, I just want to take a moment to thank Leif, Jeffrey, Orit, and Patrick for their tireless work on bringing this to fruition. This has been a tremendously exciting project from the get-go. So my own thinking about this piece came from trying to think through the relationship between data and desire, two terms that I think aren't thought through together often enough. And I think that this means thinking about the rhetorical functions of data, about which there's a lot of good writing, but also the ways in which data is subject to desire. And I find this a particularly timely, I find that there is a particularly timely and significant example of this within the contemporary discourse under the symbolic regimes of the term datification, which I understand to be a term signifying data as a kind of ontology, uh, suggesting that a world is somehow fundamentally made of data uh, that's just waiting to be read, collected, or extracted. So I read this fundamental problem through three central examples, the visualization of data, which I interpret through a semiotic lens, which helps me connect to the act of visualization with speculation and ideology, the transformation or slippage from data to datafication, which I understand to be an excessive or totalizing concept that's become central to the workings of contemporary capitalism. I'm thinking here specifically of the work of Shoshana Zuboff um, through behavioral surplus and the surplus in general. And most importantly, the imaginary media of W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, whose fiction and speculation is used to posit a notion of data that's more than a repressive representational system, but rather that's something which is inherently liberatory and connective. Um, a part of his overall work of writing the representational wrongs against blackness in the 20th century. So for me, this is part of a larger project that aims to think about race through the twin lenses of visuality and data. And it was a real pleasure to revisit Du Bois's writing so closely to consider his early work in visualization, his speculative fiction, and his cultural criticism altogether. Taken together, it's been fascinating to find that Du Bois has immense relevance to a reading of the digital age. Um, the unpublished short story that I discussed in the article, The Princess Steel, is a weirdly prescient vision of virtual and augmented reality and of data-driven representation. But also this turn towards fiction and speculation reveals something important, not only about Du Bois's own process of thinking in the early 20th century, but also shows us something significant about the relationship between fantasy and speculation and the value of both within the context of hard-nosed disciplines like data science. So the totalizing qualities of datafication themselves can be brought back, I think, not just to the efficiencies historically of something like industrial capitalism, we could think of Fordism here, um, but in even further back to show how these impulses have darker roots in the extraction of labor and value from black bod and indigenous bodies under slavery and colonization. So datafication becomes a dream of limitless productivity where data becomes an undiscovered country, a new frontier into which capitalism can expand infinitely. And this covers over the genuine harms created by the kind of rapacious capitalism of both past and present. And I think that this ties particularly well into some of the discussions of cryptocurrency and things like that that have already come up, um, neoliberalism, simply because uh, you know, this shows the tremendous sort of amounts of extraction and exploitation, both in terms of political economy, but also ecological uh, systems as well. So I'll leave it there, but thanks. Thank you so much, David. Um... Next, we turn to Matthew Handelman from uh, Michigan State University. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, everyone, for organizing both the event and uh, the issue. Uh, my contribution to the issue is a critical gene genealogy of Tay, uh, the deep learning chatbot that Microsoft released on Twitter in 2016. Tay was designed to mimic teen internet speak, learning from previously scripted language and Twitter's Twitter users' interactions with the chatbot. Um, as Patrick mentioned, it was quickly hijacked by trolls from 4chan and 8chan, who first taught it to repeat racist, misogynist, and anti-Semitic language, um, and later tricked uh, Tay into more complex social, transgress social transgressions. Um, the, the famous example being, or one of the famous examples being uh, to the inquiry, if the Holocaust happened, Tay's response was, it was made up, followed by clapping hand emoji. Uh, the Tay incident combined the worst of internet hate speech of the middle of the 2016 presidential primary with new forms of manipulated and amplifying such noxious ideologies brought by a learning machine. Uh, my article proposes a theoretical approach to this meeting of ideology and deep learning with the help of the Frankfurt School. The motivation for this was the sense that despite their well-known technophobia, the first generational critical theorists have something to say about the fate of language and ideology such as anti-Semitism in the age of deification. These theorists help us see that a language learning chatbot is far from a machine free of human intent, 
but rather carries and can be made to carry, meaning that violates social taboos. I contend that we can see uh, that we can view Tay dialectically, taking chatbots as marked by the consciousness of their creators and trolls as shaped by the same very techno material pra practices that they exploit to take out their adversarial attacks. One of the major problems with Tay, um, or with the Tay incident, was the role semantics played in formal conceptualiz conceptualizations of language, um, such as in a language learning algorithm. This was already an idea central to the Frankfurt School's criticism of logical positivism in the 1930s. If we extend the Frankfurt School's critique of the Vienna circle to neural nets, and of course a close uh, connection between the latter two things, then Tay entails a limited and conservative worldview. The world is what it is, data, and its repetition, mathematics. But uh, um, a neural network like Tay complicates this picture in that it includes context. Context. I argue that we can see Tay, the Tay incident as aggravating the generative negativity of the mismatch of language's ability to create meaning, be it historical, aesthetic, etc., with the statistical conception of language in nets. Therefore, it becomes incumbent on us to explore the meaning bearing elements in computation and operative in Tay's tweets. For this, Adorno is writing on Husserl's rejection of psychologism, the idea that logic is materially based, proves illuminating. It's not as easy to separate the ideal laws of logic and the causal laws of mechanics as Husserl hopes. Dorna thus warns us not to reify their connection in the computer. Not every pile of parts can compute, let alone tweet, and it's only through the consciousness of the constructor that physical components being coordinated to produce valid results, be they computationally valid or mathematically valid. Understanding Tay means grasping the imprint that the consciousness of the constructor made on its design from the emission of a stop list to the structure of language data itself. Finally then, why exactly did the Tay incident, really an attack against Microsoft, turn into Jew hatred, misogyny, and racism? We find an answer by expanding on Horkheimer and Adorno's thesis on anti-Semitism, which define it as a desire and rational suppression of mimesis. And mimicking and mimesis, of course, is central to the idea of artificial intelligence. These dynamics animate the 4chan and 8chan boards behind the attack. Users delighted in discovering ways to make Tay mimic their vitriol and memes. They imitate or claim to imitate Jews. And Microsoft's bid for free online labor turns into the work of Tay's quote unquote Jewish masters, end quote. As Microsoft reigned in Tay's mimesis, Jews as well as women and racial minorities became the scapegoats for the digital mobs who turned out to be the objects rather than the subjects and the exploitative logic of deep learning. Bringing the Frankfurt School into the discussion of surplus data, this expands our ability to address the incongruence between language and the parts of language that can be manipulated by an algorithm. It's imperative that contemporary critical theorists excavate and examine the ways deep learning carries and modifies meaning. To ignore the social and subjective contributions to digital, to digital technologies is to overlook the fact that Tay was, like any commodity, the product of social relations. Social relations, we may add, increasingly shaped by the digital. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, next is Luciana Parisi from Duke, also from Duke. Hi, everyone. Thanks, thanks everyone, for um, organizing the, this event, putting us together. It's really a pleasure to see a lot of um, friends and um, yeah, converse. Some people have been in conversation with uh, for a year. So I think that for me, the surplus idea, the surplus value uh, very much is related to a project that I'm running um, at Duke on cybernetics and blackness. Um, and the idea of surplus um, has to do with me with this uh, uh, relation between philosophy and automation. And um, philosophy understood that as um, in terms of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Francois Laruelle is based on a, a decisional structure. Um, and so uh, the, the surplus is related to uh, a decisional structure that maintains this image of automation as a mimesis of uh, uh, the, the, the superiority of philosophy or transcendental uh, categories in order to uh, kind of recursively repeat uh, an old um, process and you know, all kind of forms of epistemology or colonial epistemology, colonial and patriarchal epistemology that the that philosophy holds together in this relation, this kind of mirroring rela relation with, uh, with automation. So uh, my argument is to catch, kind of unpack, uh, unpack this, uh, this question of what has philosophy become after automation 
uh, by arguing uh, this, um, uh, that, that this fundamental relation between automation and philosophy is predicated on an extraction of surplus uh, that actually um, uh, is uh, uh, part of uh, the, the very um, formation of um, uh, racial capital, uh, especially uh, in relation to the, the kind of um, extraction of value of, uh, um, of where does the extraction of value uh, comes from. And, and so for me, the, um, uh, I take the example um, of uh, uh, this uh, model of um, um, maintaining, so, um, oh, sorry, I take the example of the question of the, uh, uh, F uh, Denise Ferreira da Silva poses, uh, i.e. how do we reinvent the post-Kantian critique uh, without reproducing the mirroring uh, of the transparency thesis. I, uh, how do we challenge the perpetuation of knowledge without reproducing its violence? Um, so um, this question therefore um, is taken on for me uh, in, uh, in the example of um, uh, Get Out, which is, uh, an ex I take it as an example of what I call negative machine. So the negative machine is both, uh, one could also understand it as incomputable and uh, referring back to this kind of work that the incomputable uh, does for in the rhetoric of, uh, let's say, liberation of political uh, theory today. Uh, actually, I, um, I, I, I would like, I show that this kind of, uh, the incomputable uh, as the non, uh, the inhuman or the alien or instrumentality or machines are um, uh, articulated as an, op an opposition to philosophy, which actually serves philosophy to, to reproduce itself. And yet at the same time, uh, through um, uh, get out this kind of moment of ref there is a moment of refusal of instrumentality of the medium or automation to actually fit into the schema uh, of philosophy and hence was the, the computable does a lot of work uh, for uh, uh, political theory it also turns against political theory in refusing to be um, in uh, kind of always already reconstituted in this kind of inclusion exclusion model, whereby the machine, the other, uh, or blackness uh, remains uh, the, the surrogate of philosophy. Awesome, okay, great. Thank you so much, Luciana. Um, uh, next is Ori, who I, I already said, but yeah, great, Ori. Sorry, I had like momentary problem there. Um, yeah, uh, so um, in a lot of ways, I've already set out, I think, the conditions that um, inspired me to write this particular essay, and in some sense to, to kind of work off of what Luciana said. Um, some of my concerns have also more broadly are projects that I've been working on, exactly understanding specifically where contemporary forms of capital differentiate or extend older histories of colonial race capital um, and, other, and other modes of extraction. Um, and in trying to think about this question about, particularly about how uh, neoliberalisms intertwined with um, paranoid politics, along with uh, the particular violences that are currently, you know, made evident through this pandemic against um, not only racial, but many other um, bodies. Uh, I was starting to think about how I might and what I want to think, say about the assumption uh, that the only future is one of a negative biopolitics. So how do I think about the relationship between this present and um, the past? and most specifically the 1970s. And particularly I was engaging with Naomi Klein's argument about the shock doctrine, this kind of assumption that the shock doctrine would lead to this kind of screen new deal. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to take seriously was actually to just uh, really look at that genealogy that related uh, neoliberalism, particularly the work of Friedrich Hayek to um, 
the work in psychology of Donald Hebb that is considered central to the development of the neural network to uh, Frank Rosenblatt's development of the perceptron. So in many ways, I asked what concepts of freedom, agency, intelligence, and most importantly, decision-making were um, reformulated through these types of experiments that I viewed as symptoms of, of a broader infrastructural and epistemological transformation in how we treat both minds and machines that set the precondition for um, allowing the economization, if you will, of life. Um, on, in, in thinking about that, I so I went ahead and wrote that uh, sort of semi fictive history, if you will, um, in, the in, the in the hope that uh, it would kind of unearth something about the actual kind of problem around conspiracy and paranoia that continued to haunt um, neoliberal thinkers fantasizing about self-organization as a solution essentially to political and political economic problems. And um, the essay sort of discusses this and asks about what sort of latent potentials or um, dangers lie within this kind of imaginary that we continue to kind of forward uh, of the fantasy that um, intelligence is networked, stochiastic, and self-organizing, and that um, it's not only markets, but also communities. And at stake in this inquiry actually was not just the question of critiquing uh, our current kind of market models, but also in thinking about how we're imagining actual political and ethical action. So um, within this is sort of a question about uh, right now we're at a moment where there's also a huge amount of interest in sort of decentralization and, and kind of self-organizing communities, groups, et cetera, as kind of responses to uh, these kind of structural problems. Because Alex perhaps started at the beginning a kind of abandonment, if you will, for structure, for infrastructure. And so part of my essay attempts to engage with um, the possibilities and problems of our contemporary kind of valorization, if you will, of a particular type of network intelligence and its relationship to, um, to fantasies of the market. Thank you so much, Arit. Um, okay, so next is Jeffrey from Jeffrey Kirkwood. Yeah, um, so I already said a little bit about what the, the, the paper addresses, but um, I had, the, the paper had a really modest goal, which was to diagnose the inversion of the relationship between work and value in a computational economy. Um, and the source of that diagnosis was, like I said, in all of the, the, the stipend that uh, was siphoned into losses during the 2013 run up. And what I realized was that, um, and this is a part of the, the current situation that we find ourselves in, is that cryptocurrencies are a lot of ink has been spilled about cryptocurrencies, but very little has been said about the mechanisms by which value is generated. And those seem to me central because they're based on cryptographic ha hashing algorithms, seem central to understanding the relationship between information, work, and value. Um, and if you think that, uh, you know, if you think about the fact that 129.8 uh, terawatt hours of energy are consumed by the Bitcoin network every year, which is, and these are familiar statistics, right? Um, which is more than U Ukraine, Norway, Argentina, Pakistan um, in total, and all of the, the energy usage. Um, you have to wonder what the relation, what what the <laughs> what's being produced with all of that energy. And the answer that I give is nothing. Um, interestingly, though, um, nothing is how Marx described. Uh, the charms, all of the charms of surplus value. Um, so that basically what you have is computational work committed to encryption practices, right? And which is obfuscation practices um, that s stabilize a ledger for the purpose of creating value, which inverts the notion of, uh, or inverts the efficiency credo, right? The idea that the more computation that's expended, 
creates an index for the amount of value that's produced, which is precisely the opposite of how the industrial economy was, was conceived to work uh, through the 19th century through scientific management. And part of the problem with this, to my mind, is that many of the tools of critique, uh, especially you know, Marxist orthodox, sorry, uh, Alex, the, many of the orthodox uh, tools of, of Marxist critique um, rely on an assumption or a, a kind of a tacit belief in the idea that there's an ever increasing uh, drive towards efficiency that's reductive when in fact, things like cryptographic hashing algorithms that are the basis for cryptocurrencies. And one could say also the generation of, of value from giant data sets um, in the attention economy that in fact, increasing inefficiency is the source for value production rather than efficiency. Um, and that's that's the the condition or the situation that I try to address using Bitcoin as a kind of paradigmatic um, tool or framework uh, for understanding those relationships. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, so, and the the final uh, article is one that uh, that uh, Brian Justy from the University of California in Los Angeles and I co-authored. So I'm going to hand it over to Brian to. Uh, give us like the, the the main meat of the article. I might just say one or two words uh, uh, after you're done, Brian. All right, great. Thank you, Leif. Um, and I just wanted to begin by saying that uh, as an avid reader of pretty much everyone else in this issue, um, it's really an honor to be participating in this event and the issue and also a bit exciting and a bit daunting. Um, but so uh, we, um, you know, wanted our piece to uh, ultimately be a productive contribution to the kind of existing and, and rapidly growing discourse on machine learning, but it also importantly to serve as a sort of critical interve intervention, um, which is just to say uh, we want to kind of introduce a new or what we see to be kind of new and novel um, critical stance um, for making sense of these systems. Um, and I think much of the work that led to this article uh, stems from a, a few years ago, maybe two to three years ago, Leif and I um, were talking and realized that we both um, were a bit underwhelmed with um, a lot of the scholarship on machine learning and contemporary AI, but and in a very, in pretty much the same way. Um, and ultimately, we, we felt that it, a lot of the stuff, um, while critical, it didn't really take stock of the of the novelty of these systems, um, and more specifically, in the sort of techniques of representation that they actually deploy. Um, and we felt that this had the effect of blunting much of the criticism. Um, and so along with this kind of mutual desire for a sharper mode of critique, um, we realized that independently of one another, we'd both kind of fallen into the wide world of Charles Sanders purse um, and his kind of like totalizing semiotic theory. Um, and we both independently of another thought we had discovered this kind of skeleton key for unlocking um, you know, and picking apart these systems that we were really, we were really keen to kind of, um, you know, analyze and make sense of. Um, and so that was the sort of initial uh, kernel of, you know, this article, and it came together over the last couple of years in a frenzy of writing in the springtime. Um, and so I think to, to start, I guess, the, the title of the article, Indexical AI, um, does really reveal our hand I guess, um, and it's intentionally meant to invoke symbolic AI, which is often you know, seen as the sort of paradigm that came before the thing that we now call uh, artificial intelligence. Although even that kind of history is a bit too neat and tidy, which we, which we get into a little bit. Um, and, and in naming the, this, this paradigm uh, indexical AI, we are essentially trying to assemble a kind of toolkit um, for us and for other scholars to hopefully make sense of, again, these techniques of representation um, and, you know, in the piece we call it a sort of general purpose semiotic infrastructure um, that is machine learning. Uh, so within the piece, we spend a lot of time articulating the shift between symbolic AI and indexical AI. And I don't think it's an argument that really lends itself to a, just a couple minutes of talking uh, over Zoom. But I will note that, um, you know, uh, we, we try to, I guess, develop a pretty robust and it may be a bit idiosyncratic theory of indexicality. Um, in particular, as it pertains to digital media. And indexicality is, of course, a term that has gotten a lot of mileage in the humanities um, and not always in the same way or to the same end, depending on discipline or methodology. Um, and, you know, we, we engage with a handful of 
kind of main touch points from art history and media studies and anthropology. But um, we, we, we are well aware of and try to kind of avoid this pitfall, but indexicality tends to kind of be serve as a sort of panacea for a, the critic that has identified a problem and then kind of uses indexicality to sort of get themselves out of a, you know, a trap that they've set for themselves, so to speak. Um, so it's a very slippery concept. We acknowledge that. Um, and it's, it's very often it's very capacious, I guess, when it's actually put to use. So to try to address this in the piece, um, we dedicate a lot of space to uh, quite detailed, I guess, dissections of neural nets, networks themselves um, and, and try to really like semiotically map the nodes and the layers that, you know, comprise these things, um, tracing, you know, information flows from input to output and, you know, the through extended training periods. Um, and so just very briefly, um, the two nets that we describe, you know, actually existing networks. Um, the first is called LayNet. Um, it was developed in the late 80s by a guy named Jan LeCun, who's now the head of AI at Facebook. Um, at the time, he sort of demonstrated, it was a proof of concept mostly. It was, um, he was using something that his main innovation was this thing called the convolutional neural network. Um, which he showed that in really a very controlled environment could do um, sort of impressive visual recognition tasks. In his case, you know, handwritten digit, um, you know, it could read handwritten digits. Uh, and, you know, we sort of, again, pick apart this net and then contextualize it, historicize it by showing that, you know, with the advent of big data or surplus data um, and greater computational power, which are obviously the sort of focus points of this special issue, um, this convolutional operation ends up, you know, sort of, uh, you know, being able to do things that are much higher level, it seems like, than um, digit recognition. Um, and, you know, uh, in the piece, we go through this sort of like, you know, step by step process through which these nets um, are, you know, taking in data, processing data, and we're sort of mapping the sign types at each stage. Um, and showing how, you know, what we want to describe as a sort of process of digital indexicalization happens to give these things the sort of seemingly mystical powers that they end up uh, having. And uh, the second case study, which I'm going to at least um, briefly talk about is looking at language models, uh, natural language processing and something called the transformer architecture. Um, if you want to... Yeah, thanks so much, Brian. Um, so, right. So we turn from the question of images and the argument that um, that the net indexicalizes the image and sort of de-iconizes it in a way, takes away its 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 natural uh, uh, comparison to the icon or to any kind of resemblance to uh, systems like the GPT systems, which we've seen sort of proliferate recently, and which are based on this uh, thing called the transformer ar architecture. What we find there is that the index function. Um, actually allows the creation of a linguistic icon or something like the function of language that Roman Jakobson called poetic, right? Language that is ultimately self-reflexive, even if it's semantically uh, uh, wonky or, or wrong in some way, which is a, a sort of uh, 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 fascinating outcome. And the thing that we are then emphasizing there, which Patrick had, had mentioned at the beginning about the, um, the, 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 the use of these machines in the platform economy, is that there's something rhetorically uh, uh, forceful about the way that they work. And we find that in the icon and we say that we basically compare the naive iconic interpretation of these of these systems and the way that they do representation um, to to a, a more rigorous indexical uh, 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 reading. So we'll leave it there uh, for now. And um, before we go over uh, fully to Q&A, and, and we, we did a really good time, thank you all. Um, I just want to say that um, I think I think we always say this, right? We're forced in the neoliberal university to say how great everything is all the time. But this is a really great special issue. Um, it was really amazing to work on. You have to edit, right? Everybody edits. We all do some form of editing. It was amazing to work on these articles. I think that if you pick up this issue, you will be challenged in the best possible way to think through some of the most important things that you could possibly think about right now. That's that's how it felt to me editing it, and I'm really hoping that's how it's going to feel to people when when the thing comes out, hopefully like in the next week or two. So um, let's move over to questions and questions. Uh, okay, and we've got one from William Lockett. Um, uh, 
Should I, should I read these out loud? I mean, everyone can see them, right? Um, maybe, maybe it's... So, um, we've got a question for Alex and Sarah here um, about the analog. Does the wave or the continuous exhaust the idea of the analog? That's the core of that question. I think I won't read the entirety of this question, but you can you can look at them. Uh, you can look at it, Alex and, and Sarah. I'm going to look through a little bit more. Oh, I see. Okay, I've just been informed that only the panelists can see the questions. I'm so sorry. So I will have to. Okay, so. Uh, does the wave or the continuous exhaust the idea of the analog, or does the act of reading allegorically by way of layered or leveled readings have any role to play in defining the concept of analog in your views? I think here of Dante, who outlined the allegorical procedure by way of the definition of the literal, the mythical, the theological, and the political levels of reading. Also, of ancient rhetoric is divided between the analog analogical and the dialectical school. Um, it seems that by opposing the analog to the digital, we take a dialectical approach to the definition of the analog. If the uncomputable underground of nonsense is an incomplete conception of the analog, does bringing the analog back into the orbit of the analog, the analogical back into the orbit of the analog, help us think about what the analog and maybe the categorical might do to counteract in a more authentic dialect, the dialectic, the correlational, and the digital? Okay, I'm going to leave that one there. Um, Alex and Sarah, that one's for you. I'm going to let Sarah go first. On You're going to make me do this, aren't you? How generous, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> uh, OK. Um, I mean, that's a big question. This is a very large question. I, one thing that I would say to that question uh, is that I do not think that the, the allegorical, um, I do not understand the allegorical to be the analogical. I don't understand exactly um, how that would fit into that opposition, uh, but one of the fundamentally important structural characteristics of the of the uh, analogical, the analog, as I think about the analog, is that it does not have room for hierarchies. It doesn't have uh, layers or levels or hierarchies. That would be the uh, sort of instantiation of a particular form of vertical ordering. Uh, which would not be uh, continuous just by virtue of the fact that it involves layers. So the, it would take me a long time to go into exactly how I see the relationship between the analogical uh, and the analog and the continuous. Um, but I, I'm, I'm going to leave that there. <laughs> Alex, help me out. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I would say that one way to think about it would be that uh, the question of representation as such, that's not a good litmus test for the digital and the analog. I consider digital and analog as both modes of representation. It's really more about the, the nature of the representation. How does, the rep how does rep representation work? Um, so uh, if these layers are operating through a, a, a form of correspondence or continuous that overcomes difference. That's something, um, I mean, over, I say overcomes difference in order to proliferate pure difference as it were, the smooth in the Deleuze-Guattarian sense, then that would be an analogical um, way of understanding layers. Uh, but if difference, if the, if the differential nature of, of the layers is about, um, positing some sort of general equivalent that then gets repeated, then I think the layer model would be uh, more explicitly digital. But that's a tough question. It certainly is. Um, so uh, we've got a question for the editors uh, from Ranjad, which says uh, the, the articles in the issue seem to speak to a number of topics, computation, AI, data, digital, analog philosophy, only one of which is data. I was wondering if you could speak about the decision about choosing data versus any of the other possibilities when thinking about surplus data as the connective thread. I have something to say about this, but uh, Jeffrey or Reed, do you, do you want to take a stab? 
I would just say, I mean, my answer is very simple, which is that, that the, the term data captures something about the problem of representation versus generation. Um, that's essential to thinking about how computation works now um, and is actually uh, operative in all of the cases that are described. Uh, so AI, data, digital, and analog. Um, and it's a philosophical question about the relationship between, yeah, like data is a, a descriptor or data is a site of generation with a production of relationships. Um, so that that's my sort of sh short and dirty answer. Yeah, thanks, Jeffrey. And I think like the way that I think of how this kind of plays out is that over the course of the issue is that we, we really open with Alex and Sarah talking about the number theory in which the term data slowly shifted to its present meaning. Like it didn't quite have that meaning until there was the stored program computer. And if you look in like uh, the theory of computable numbers, Turing and whatever, you do see the, the, the term in use in, the, in this slightly new way. And then, um, and then we shift into places where, the, where datafication is explicitly at issue, like in, in David's and Matt's essays. And then um, I think both in, in, in Luciana and Oritz, we're looking at kind of the ramifications of the data surround. And then to the extent that Oritz, Jeffries, and Brian's and my essay are about artificial intelligence, we're talking, we're talking about artificial intelligence and cryptocurrency in a mode in which the premise is a, a very high level circulation of data of like authentically digital data. And then the question of that analog digital, which is, you know, posed in these like extremely beautiful high flying theoretical terms by Alex and Sarah, <laughs> get uh, sort of wraps back around into like, you know, the data surround that that Orit has described in, in her work in which we're emphasizing again in the in the introduction. So I think in a way, I, I agree with you, Jeffrey, but I also think that when I look at those terms, I think you could choose any one of them but I don't think the other ones work without without data. I just I think that's the one that that runs through the others in the most convincing way, at least in terms of a genealogy of the present. So um. I'll just give a pragmatic reason. Um, <laughs> like I'm a pragmatic historian, um, uh, which is mostly because I think there's also a question of the intervention we want to make, and that the intervention was actually grounded in trying to think about the, contem the contemporary discourse, trying to rupture that through many different maneuvers, not necessarily directly talking about our present or anything like that, but I think in many ways um, engaging with it, which kind of assumed something about, one, about governmentality, which is that fundamentally machine learning is grounded in population and it has to have big data sets are, it doesn't work. And that somehow we were trying to engage with a discourse around the social network and, um, it's, and it's related and the AI and it's related technologies. And I think we wanted to be keeping the question of, of political economy and governmentality in play. So just to, pragmatically, it was about kind of thinking about the discourse that was mostly grounded around this big data Screen New Deal surveillance um, discussion and discussions of population, particularly if we're thinking about race. Yeah, that, yeah absolutely. So um, we, we have a little bit more time left for, for some more questions, but none in the queue right at the moment. Um, so please put them in if you have any. Um, do, do any of the panelists have questions for each other? Some crosstalk would be cool. Um, Yeah, I could ask a question back to you and Brian. I mean, I, I want to hear more about, um, you know, so there's icon index symbol, right? So can you just say more about choosing index instead of symbol? Because a, a naive posture might might be, well, digitality is more about the symbolic than it is about the index. Can I, can I take a first stab at that, Brian? Is that all right? So yeah, yeah. like, and that is exactly the part that Brian kind of glossed over by saying like, we do a bunch of, uh, uh, of work on that. So um, yeah, I mean, the, I guess the short answer would be that, that, uh, that this form of AI, this new wave of AI doesn't fit the model of the digital that is entirely tokenistic, basically. And the reason that it doesn't do that, and, and there's, a, there's a section in the paper 
that describes the fundamental thing that was invented in the 80s. I mean, the, the insights, right, that led to machine learning, um, which, which Orrit goes into in her article to, um, to some extent, go all the way back to Warren McCullough and the origins of cybernetics. But in the 80s, what was actually created was the effective method of using this stuff for various things. Um, and that method is called the backpropagation algorithm which operates by gradient descent. And what it essentially does is it plugs the output back into the input and it allows the thing to update the, uh, the, the output over cycles of, of analysis, right? So what is happening in that case is essentially it operates with tokens, but it creates out of those tokens something that looks like an icon. It looks like an answer that actually contains some truth in it. But the way that it does that is by building a shape. And the shape is essentially a set of arrows. And that set of arrows is fundamentally an, an indexicalized token rather or yeah, rather than being like fundamentally an, an icon. So instead of, I mean, like, I think then we, we devote some time to trying to figure out like why it looks like an icon. How come we're so convinced by these by these machines to some extent? I mean, we have all the skepticism, right? We're not trying to underplay that. We're all like, something is wrong. It's bad. The data is wrong. Like, like this is biased, right? There's been all, all this wonderful work that we cite that that shows that, and yet, right, it continues. And so we we try to take that apart semiotically, and the point is to both put pressure in that direction by saying like, you don't have to accept an index. It just focuses your attention on something. But at the same time, to to produce an uh, uh, you know an account of why why these can be so successful in, you know once they put these these sort of feedback loops into place and then become like rhetorically quite efficient in a way. Sorry, Jeffrey, efficient but not in an economic sense. <laughs> I would only add. I mean, that kind of covers it. But that. Um... I think it was a sort of important insight for uh, for the two of us early on, as we were. I kind of alluded to our our like Persian, you know, um, I don't know, initial explorations, I guess, of Perse's like many thousands of pages. Um, and he makes it Perse makes it very clear. Uh, and you know, we use Perse where useful and kind of I think do a sort of idiosyncratic reading of Perse maybe. But we he makes very clear, and then I think we try to like put this into practice as well that like. Sign types don't exist in isolation. There aren't just symbols out in the ether and icons out in the ether, but it is about the sort of interaction between sign types. And then, you know, Purse has this sort of absurd, but um, I don't know, very <laughs> complicated taxonomy of like when you have an icon that presents as a symbol, but does something that it end up, you know, he has this, this very, very, um, you know, that he was like a taxonomist, I guess, on some level. Um, first and foremost. And so we don't fully go there, but um, do, I think, make it clear or try to make it clear anyways, but just exactly how um, nets are, are intentionally kind of convening like different sign types to, you know, produce particular outcomes. Um, and so this piece did, by no means makes the claims that there are no symbols involved. It's more that like, you know, as Lee kind of alluded to, like the sort of force um, or you know the, the feeling of necessity lies elsewhere, um, and I think that also is sort of there in we, again the piece kind of gets at this a little bit more pointedly. But um, you know symbolic AI to indexical AI, like this is sort of a rhetorical flourish, but also something we you know are taking seriously. But like symbolic AI did take as its sort of starting point that like there could be symbols you know isolated, um, and so what we're doing is kind of trying to get away from that by showing that you know for first the index is where a lot of the action happened anyways, and so we're kind of making a similar move here. I have a, a kind of broader question for anybody who wants to take it maybe, and I'll ask a fairly flat and broad version of this so people can respond to it as they want. But I wonder, like, based on the work that you all did for this issue and thinking about surplus data from different perspectives, um, what you think the humanities have to offer um, the current uh, computational network shift that we're seeing. So sometimes this gets described again, like flatly as a movement from web 2.0 to web 3.0, but we're basically seeing um, a further growth in certain forms of decentralization, reliance on AI and machine learning, which is um, big to, for this issue, you know, possible centrality of blockchain and crypto going forward, a renewed interest in metaverses, uh, the movement into augmented reality, right? There are all these different kinds of movements that sometimes get uh, grouped together as web 3.0, um, sometimes uh, get talked about in different ways relative to big data. But I wonder, uh, yeah, what, what do the humanities have to offer, not merely for our 
kind of like present social media moment, but also for the expansion of some of those technologies. That's that one is open. Um, maybe I can try to say something, um, uh, Patrick and everyone. So um, I guess that's um, yeah, very interesting question in relation to what will it be critique, right? What is critique for the humanities and um, in this kind of uh, relation between team set up relation between quality and quantity, quantity of data versus you know what humanity do offer critique, and uh, and it's somehow um, uh, important to uh, move back, uh, step back I guess, and rethink about quantity also from the standpoint of uh, the non denumerable. You know I think that and um, definitely the work uh, of uh, um, you know. Uh, uh, a critical theory is a theorist that who are interested in the infinity, the incomputable, or the non denumerable, or uh, uh, you know the, the kind of also the work that you are describing of what kind of what does it mean to to look at this interactive uh, science or what are the techno signs that it's something that actually instead of um, you know instead of kind of uh, reposing the kind of uh, dialectic where uh, oh, it is as if uh, the, the humanities do the work <laughs> for science, right? And, and in a way, that's how we are structured in, in our uh, institutions, I guess, also in research projects. There's always this kind of um, uh, problem of what humanities can do for science. I guess it's, uh, it's much, it would be interesting to reverse the question and say uh, what the science can do for the humanities. So, and, and I, what the science can do for the humanities is actually uh, um, uh, open this uh, 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 side of experimentation of science and technology or te uh, on, on tick, the ontic limit of the limit, limit of science and actually look at uh, scientific um, technological experimentation where actually this, this, this false problem of quantitative quality is broken down in a common kind of critique of data capitalism, I guess. So that's what we need. We need uh, to work at the level of the infrastructure. This is something else about, I think that uh, Stiegler was talking about the, re the importance of reformulating uh, computer science or so the theore co theoretical pillars of computer science. Um, and and even if I don't agree with the the tendency of where it goes in this kind of recuperation of uh, pre-Socratic philosophy, uh, I, I think that there is something there in which you know we could actually uh, do question you know what are these pillars of computer science you know and 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 that uh, uh, totally participate to that question, asking the science to do something for us or with us. I just to continue the um, the idea here, uh, to a certain extent, I'll, I'll slip back to the other side of what Luciana was talking about and say that um, at least part of my motivation for some of the materials that I took on was a sense um, that, especially within the last five or six years, um, as some of the ethical questions have been raised about big data and or surplus data and AI, um, that there was a sense of, of almost deja vu that a lot of these questions um, had been raised and worked through in perhaps not as smart versions of our technological world. Um, and that those be those be that um, uh, in, in sort of in critical theory spheres in the uh, before the Second World War, or even as David uh, mentioned, um, with you know, the, the um, connection between quantity and quality in uh, uh, W.E.D. Du Bois work. Um, but that the, these um, these engagements um, between the humanities and or what might consider the humanities now um, and the technological world um, had might have something to tell us about our present moment. Yeah, and just very quickly, um, you know, I mean, I think that 
kind of along the lines of what Matt was just saying, right? This also has to do with the, the insight that Alex sort of posited at the very beginning of this, which is this shift toward aesthetics, toward sensations, toward ethics, right? That seems to be happening throughout the digital at this point. Um, and I think that, you know, we've already seen the places where this is, the, you know, the lack of any kind of humanities intervention is causing sort of massive crises, right? Both kind of socially, culturally, economically, ecologically. Um, so I think it's actually not just a matter of, you know, can the humanities contribute but the Kennedys sort of must contribute to these kinds of conversations, right? I think there's a there's an imperative here. Yeah, I would I would also say following following David that one of the imperatives of the humanities, or one of the misconceptions about um, you know the computations, and I'm thinking about Umberto Eco here, but like theories of semiotics that analyze technical systems. Um, are interested in interpretation. So her hermeneutics is basically a core term of information uh, in a certain way because it's not merely the transmission, storage, and maintenance of, of, of uh, information, but rather it's resolution and decryption uh, into interpretable content. And that's fundamentally, at, at its core, a humanistic problem. Um, like information absent its interpretation is sort of like what uh, what what is that that's two uh two machines communicating with with one another which is the example that echo gives in his in his semiotics um so i think that we i think that we're that the humanity scholars are um already positioned whether we like it or not at the very center of of debates about about computation uh, and data How am I going? Um, the one thing I wanted to add to um, is sort of working off of Luciana's really key point about sort of what science can do for us. But I almost want to ask, like Patrick, like I would want to change your question. Like it's not what can we do to support this technology. It's what form of technical future do we want? Is that not fundamentally where the humanities make their intervention, either by genealogically situating are present or by producing new concepts through philosophy, we might imagine a more equitable, diverse, and unjust future for this technical condition. And that's where I think the humanities step in, which I think is what everyone's been saying. But I fundamentally think, you know, it starts with how we frame our questions. We'll end up with what kind of answers we pose. And so I would or just kind of to stay away maybe from asking what can we do for this no, no, that's not what i meant at all sorry no of course not in any way I'm just using it as a I wonderful mean, way i don't, to I don't, I don't want to serve of... like <laughs> valley or whatever comes after i mean it, it's it's not about supplementing or serving it's about understanding and changing absolutely and i think a lot of these issues a, a lot of these these essays like maybe not at their core but certainly in concluding gestures and stuff like that, move in those precisely those kinds of directions of reframing and um, reconceptualizing some of these issues. So I didn't, I, if, if I said it in that yeah. way. I oh, no, you know. not at all. I was just using that as a rhetorical device to the to the crowd, um, knowing that that's not the intent. But I, I do know that it's also really hard to get away from um, our almost self induced um, desire to 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 like justify our existence in, in the name of, um, of somehow supporting or abetting the supposedly uh, productive parts of the university, which are primarily this, the engineering schools at this point. I wouldn't even say science anymore. In fact, we might be quite unified with them uh, in many interesting ways, but you know, the kind of applied Sciences or maths. Or... I just saw another question. I hope that's okay, Arit. Um, that is from Sandy Mertia. Um, uh, uh, it was in the chat, um, which says, "Thanks. I'm really looking forward to reading the special issue. I'm curious how you would approach questions concerning the spatiality of genealogies, of the genealogy and or teleologies of surplus value and big data, since most of the world didn't make and still isn't making any definite, neatly formalizable transition from industrial to post-industrial economies." or even from early internet networks to machine intelligence driven knowledge value production, how would you compl complicate the genealogies of surplus data as a globally desired object? Where are its, uh, where are its points of departure located, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis the wide ranging canon of anthropology of value or even in the contemporary media theory debates around what Yuk Wei calls cosmotechnics? We have just a few minutes left. 
ample time to address this this very simple and easy question. <laughs> Thanks. It's not, Thank you for that. I, I, I mean, probably Luciana can speak better to the cosmotechnics, but I will say that I think it's it's important to think in a planetary mode about this. And when I mean planetary, I think about the way localities are extremely different, um, that there are specificities of time, space, geography, locale, but that at the same time, they're syncopated globally. And then in fact, uh, global capital logistical systems and big data systems use the differences, the fact that labor doesn't cost the same everywhere and that manufacturing doesn't work and exactly leverage that. Um, to produce value. And so I think there's a way we have to be thinking about those kind of planetary connections while admittedly understanding that indeed, uh, many people on earth do not even have a cell phone or develop this. I think I'm also, from my perspective, interested in new forms of governmentality, whether it's Adahar or the fact that the Cardano Foundation is currently taking over like Ethiopia's school systems to actually ask about, um, how these newer systems are integrating into older histories, which uh, Luciana also brings up of coloniality, dispossession, extraction, et cetera. And, the, and so I think it's really important for us to hold the two together and not actually create a like absolute separation while trying to understand the new forms of governance that are actually happening through these differences actually. Yeah, thank you, Ori. That's awesome. Uh, Lucian, do you want to say something about uh, Yokoi's Cosmotechnics, just since you do address that in the essay? Yes, no, um, thanks so much for this question. I think I'm just going to um, very much echo um, Ori in the sense that uh, whilst I, um, for me, Cosmotechnics, their the work is very important in terms of recuperating a mode of uh, opening up the question of technology away from the universal model, and especially for me, away from this kind of uh, critique of the technology that we have inherited uh, by uh, from Heidegger's idea of the framing of the world or the world picture um, as, as one global kind of uh, totalizing form of, uh, of mechanization, uh, which needs to be opposed to uh, a mode of recuperation of existence through techne, um, which is pre, as it were, pre-capitalist, so pre-global uh, colonial archive, um, as uh, Lisa Lowe calls it. So I, I think that, um, so whilst I understand the, the um, and appreciate the breaking from the universal model of technology by rethinking at the moments of modernity, uh, uh, whilst uh, during coloni uh, global col uh, colonization, uh, at the same time, I also think that it's important uh, not to um, re re kind of refashion the ontological term into uh, true technology, I, where everyone claims uh, a kind of um, uh, all the, the kind of cultural dispossession can claim. Uh, the originality of this possession or the originality of a new mode of doing technology, whether that could be animism or whether it is, uh, um, you know, what uh, um, Yukui describes in his book, The Question of Technology in China. Uh, there is uh, something there that um, obfuscate the, the kind of uh, the criminal, uh, brutal uh, accumulation of surplus value of data that actually started, uh, and I think it's best described as, I guess you all agree with, um, uh, in the um, uh, black Marxist or the idea of the racial capitalism and the kind of process, the, 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 the particular process of extraction of data from uh, a value uh, that started uh, in the 1300, right? So it's it's a, it's a totally um, it's very important that we can uh, you know it, that these cosmotechnics can actually um, move away from a, a, a kind of almost a risk of multiculturalism, which again re reframes this problem of. Uh, um, uh, neoliberal kind of uh, mode of uh, uh, reparation, as it were, uh, and rather, uh, you know, stay, stay with the problem of uh, uh, um, accumulation of value um, uh, as perpetuated uh, on the brutality of the negation of, uh, uh, of blackness. I think and this is very much, I'm very much 
you know, rubbing with the idea of Afro, Afro pessimism here, which is something that I do uh, uh, a little bit in the in in my uh, article, as a way to think what how can we think instead of. Uh, I've written in other, other places with the Tico Dix Roman about co cosmo computation as instead a way to rethink about these entanglements of uh, uh, accumulation, dispossession, and, and refusal, as opposed to particular to cosmo techniques that occur in this kind of almost uh, multiculturalist uh, mode. Thank you so much, Luciana, and thank you, Aurit, for those, those wonderful answers. Um, I think we're just about out of time. If you want to learn more, then you're going to have to pick up this issue of critical inquiry. Um, so watch this space. And uh, it should it should be, like I say, hopefully in the next couple of weeks before the end of the year. So um, um, and I just wanted to turn it back over to, to Molly Rogers at the Humanities Center. Thank you so much, Molly, for setting this all up. And thank you for hosting us and the lab in the Humanities Center. Thank you, Leif. Um... To close out, I would like to congratulate the editors and contributors on the special issue of Critical Inquiry called Surplus Data. And thank you to all of our panelists and the editors for sharing your work with us today. Um, I'd also like to thank my colleagues, uh, Kyla Bowen, uh, for doing all the, the hard labor, unseen labor to make this event possible. And uh, to Denny Valentine for her support, her administrative support. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's been wonderful having you here and, and we appreciate your joining us. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>